Okay, well, we will cover uh, this introduction to anthropology uh, focused on the biology of man um, in these uh, categories. Uh, first, what is anthropology? Then some areas of study under the broad umbrella of anthropology, um, especially those three that we're going to dive into this in this course. Um, some approaches to anthropology. We have the uh, biblical approach, then we have the secular humanist approach. Uh, some uh, a note about general and special revelation and the role that it plays in science. Uh, naturalism, uh, we'll look at the naturalistic uh, approach to anthropology, uh, the view of evolution. We'll look at some compromise positions between evolution and uh, creation, and then we'll look at creationism as well, and then we'll go over the homework uh, before we go. Uh, before we get started, uh, because some of the uh, homework questions will have to do with this, and also since somebody might choose to write a position paper uh, on this topic, I will uh, provide you with a few more resources that you can do more research on, and it will be good resources that you can go to. Uh, the first one that I would recommend is ICR, Institute of Creation Research. Uh, lots of good papers. You can search by topic uh, on that uh, webpage. Uh, a very conservative and uh, also dispensational uh, uh, creation uh, science uh, website. And then there's also Answers in Genesis. Very good in creation. Uh, be careful in their prophecy and soteriology. Um, but as a creation resource, it is uh, very good. Also, I would recommend Ray Mondragon. He has a website. Uh, the address is For His Glory nm.org for his glory new mexico nm.org he has a section under there on creation science and he's a regular uh, he's regularly interviewed uh, for creation science in uh, on a secular radio show and uh, he handles himself very well he's a board member at chafer seminary uh, so he's a trustworthy source as well i would also recommend charlie clough's bible framework uh, this is a 224 uh, uh, audio files uh, included with notes, but the first uh, 20 or so will deal with a lot of these issues of creation and evolution and their implications um, in scripture, uh, specifically for worldview. Uh, so those first few are going to deal with uh, worldview issues from self uh, evolution. Uh, some of the special issues that we'll deal with here. Uh, one good book resource is The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. Uh, very good handling of why uh, the, uh, the creation view is far superior to the evolution view. Issues that uh, the evolutionist needs to explain before their view can even be viable. Uh, another good one um, by Tim Chaffee and Jason Lyle. Old Earth Creationism on Trial. The verdict is in. Uh, one of the homework options is to cover this topic of uh, old earth creationism. <clears throat> and the last one I will uh, mention is called Unformed and Unfilled, a Critique of the Gap Theory. Uh, so this will provide an alternative view and I think a better view than you'll get in the um, optional reading for last week the uh the view of arnold fruchtenbaum he, he takes a gap view um, of creation and so you'll see him explain his view in that if you choose to read and write on that um, but i do want to offer you a a uh, what i think is a, a better handling of the text so that book will uh, will help with that so with that uh, let's jump into the topic for this week, which is uh, beginning with anthropology, what is it? Uh, most of us have heard this in, in the context of secular anthropology. If you've gone to college, this would have been one of the course offerings that you have there, uh, but they would offer it from a naturalistic perspective. Uh, anthropology uh, in English comes actually from Latin anthropologia, uh, which is the study of mankind. But the Latin comes from its Greek root words. Uh, those Greek words are anthropos, which is 
which means mankind or a man in the Greek and combined with the Greek word for logos, uh, which is word, thought, study, or reason. And in this case, the Latin carried through the meaning of study um, in logos. So in Latin, anthropologia means the study of mankind. So that's what uh, we are engaged in here, the study of mankind. And being that this is biblical anthropology, we are concerned primarily with what the Bible has to tell us about uh, mankind. Now, the Bible, being the ultimate authority of truth and reason, um, is the best source we can go to to understand. And we'll get into uh, special and general revelation and see that um, a study of man that is not biblical anthropology is uh, is going to be hindered by denying the supernatural aspect of of uh, of revelation which is necessary to fully understand man particularly in his origins and in his composition the areas of anthropology uh, that will concern us in this course uh, we will begin with biology today we'll study man's physical nature his origins and his function um, we will look at man's psychology as well, the study of the human mind, personality, and spirituality. And man's sociology, the study of man's relationships to his environment and other beings, being both uh, humanity and uh, his relationship to God. Uh, these three areas are not the only areas of anthropology. We could get into uh, language. We could get into uh, uh, history and geography uh, for humans, but uh, these three will really uh, give us a lot of information, especially from a biblical perspective that will set the groundwork uh, for everything else. The Bible isn't uh, silent on the other issues either. Uh, for example, anthropological language studies, uh, we get the only good information about where the languages of mankind came from. Uh, in the creation account, or particularly in Genesis 11, with the division of the languages at Babel. So uh, scripture is able to tell us things that we cannot uh, know otherwise, or that have been lost to history. So there's two distinct approaches to anthropology, as I've mentioned already. Uh, there is the naturalistic approach, and there's the supernaturalism approach. Uh, Concerning these three areas that we're studying, under naturalism, uh, the biology of man is said to be a cosmic accident, the product of chance and natural selection. So in this uh, case, chance is really the God uh, that creates, and natural selection is the agent of creation. Uh, so these would replace then God the Father and uh, Jesus the Son in that creation. Uh, and then... Uh, energy misapplied would probably be the uh, the uh, replacement that it has for the Holy Spirit. Uh, under psychology, naturalism would say that man's internal being is the result of instinct and conditioning from his environment. Uh, this is contrary to biblical revelation concerning uh, man's psychological makeup and character. Uh, concerning his sociology, man is without inherent purpose. Uh, any relationships that he has with the world outside of himself, he has no uh, specific responsibility to, uh, since there is no standard for good or evil. Um, and any attempt that that uh, naturalism tries to make for a standard of good and evil has to be artificial or else borrowed from presuppositions of supernatural. And so within itself, uh, naturalism cannot have a standard of good or bad, and therefore relationships in man's sociology um, has no purpose or standard. On the other hand, we have supernaturalism, uh, where uh, concerning man's biology, he is designed by the creator. Uh, he is the product of God's love and creativity. Uh, now, when we, we look at the world today, it has a bent towards naturalism that is pervasive. So when you go into any public school, you're going to see naturalism taught uh, in every single subject, not just science, not just um, 
not just biology, psychology, sociology, but in all of the uh, fields of study. And this is one reason, I think, why we have such, uh, for example, suicidal ideation in the culture, because man is taught that there is no purpose for them and there is uh, no creator who loves them. And uh, they, are, they are being denied reality in all of these areas. Um, and man is meant to live in reality, in conformity to God's, uh, God's creation, which coheres with reality. Uh, so we are unseating uh, truth and purpose and reality from, from the minds of young children, and they grow up to be adults. Um, and uh, not much maturity comes from that because there's really no purpose to anything. Uh, under psychology and supernaturalism, we see that man's inner being is the seat of his personality and spirituality. Um, we will note as we go along as well that naturalism cannot tell us anything about man's psychology. We can recognize uh, the results that it might have on his interactions with other people or in the, uh, the uh, physical expressions that he might have from his internal psychology, but science really is incapable of probing uh, the supernatural side of what man is. Attempts to do so tend to result in occultism. Um, and so we, we do want to avoid that, uh, that godless uh, merging of science and supernaturalism. Uh, we, we have to keep God as the central figure in that, and God as the ultimate authority on those things, because uh, the world does have a spirit that is, uh, that is a spiritual, supernatural reality. Uh, that is trying to have its fellowship with man, um, but uh, this is demonic, and so we don't want to uh, enter into supernaturalism apart from God. Um, sociology, uh, under supernaturalism, says that man was created for a purpose. Uh, man has specific relationships to himself, uh, to fellow man, to creation beneath him, and to God above him and that man fits perfectly in God's created universe um, and has a purpose for God's glory. On this uh, important division between naturalism and supernaturalism, we want to see uh, what scripture has to say about the natural world around us and the supernatural realm. Uh, these are not actually opposed to one another. The natural world and the supernatural world. Biblical revelation uh, readily accepts both, but by necessity we need both to understand reality. Naturalism is not the other side of the coin to supernaturalism. It is the denial of supernaturalism. Supernaturalism accepts both as part of reality. And so what naturalism has done is it has chopped off half of the equation um, and believes that it can find a solution uh, without the other half of the equation. Uh, so in scripture, we have both general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is our ability to observe the created world uh, that God has placed us in and to gain knowledge from those observations. So man can observe and probe the nature around him for knowledge. This knowledge is empirical. That means that uh, we have evidence to believe such things. It is based on observable, testable, and repeatable experimentation. Now, this at, at its heart is the definition of the scientific method. This is how we discover things scientifically. We are able to observe it. We're able to test it. And once we've done that test, we're able to repeat that test and get the same results. Uh, that is how we come to know truth from general revelation. Uh, this is generally the role of science, and it is limited to the natural sphere. It is not opposed to scripture, and scripture is not opposed to it, but it has its limitations. Uh, on the other hand, special revelation, uh, uh, man's ability to observe, test all things, and repeat these testings is limited by his finite nature is limited to his present physical experience. He cannot stretch into the past. He cannot stretch into the future and make observations and tests. Only what has been recorded by those who are able to observe and test at that time. He's not able to repeat those experiments in the past or the future, but only in his present. 
uh, man can neither experiment on historical phenomena or spiritual realities. Uh, and this is this is very important. Uh, this is probably too small to see, um, but if we get the uh, the general gist of the image here, this actually comes from Charlie Clough's Bible Framework, where he's talking about the limitations of observation based empirical knowledge. So if you look at that, um, well, let me make this bigger for myself at least. If we look at um, the blue box, the light blue box, uh, we would designate this as things that are directly observable by, by mankind, both in space and in time. It has to be observed within man's uh, present existence. It cannot be observed past or future. And it has to be observed in the place where he physically is. Man is neither omnipotent or omnipresent. He's not able to uh, personally see into the past or future or into places where he is not present. And so uh, he's limited in time and space. There is the historical testimony of other men who have been able to observe and test and repeat. Um, and we can accept their testimony. In fact, scripture even uses this as an argument uh, in, uh, in 1 John 5. John makes the argument, you accept the testimony of men, how much greater then is the testimony of God? So when God says you have eternal life based on faith alone, we take that with far greater uh, weight in its testimony than any testimony that man might have. But generally it is accepted and it is not wrong um, to trust the observations and uh, witness and testimony of trustworthy men. Uh, this is how information is transmitted down through the ages. Uh, and then we're able to extend that, uh, what we're able to observe and, uh, and have testimony on, but not completely. We're able to use some instruments, for example, we can use a microscope to observe things that we can't see with the naked eye. Uh, we're able to enhance our abilities, but we're not able to break out of our abilities in time and space. Uh, we're able to use a telescope to see things that are too distant for us. Um, we're able to use ultra speed filming to slow things down that are too fast for us to see. Um, but still, this is only within our space and time. Uh, we are limited in that sense. So uh, science is um, a justifiable uh, means of acquiring knowledge. And scripture uh, demonstrates this as well, but science divorced from biblical revelation is destined for error um, because, again, we're cutting off half the equation. So we can look at a few examples in scripture, especially in the first two chapters of Genesis, and we see how divine revelation works together with general uh, revelation. So divine revelation is the gift of perfect interpretation of what we're observing. We can observe something and make hypotheses of what it is and hypotheses of why it is. Divine revelation is the final say on what it is. And so it gives us a control case. It gives us the absolute perfect interpretation of something that then we can base other observations and interpretations off of. So Adam observed the animals uh, that God had created, and he was able to see that there's not a suitable mate for him. But what he is not able to extrapolate from that is what a suitable mate for him would be. Only God is able to reveal that. So in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This is divine revelation or special revelation. We see that God put Adam in a situation where this special revelation would be reinforced by general revelation or by the scientific method in a primitive sense here, although I don't think Adam was by any means a primitive person in his understanding, probably far superior to us in his ability to understand, but this is a very simple scientific test uh, that Adam was able to conduct. It says, uh, out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. Now in Genesis 1 we see that this happened before Adam was formed. And so Adam had to receive this information from general revelation or from a special revelation. God had to tell him that that's what he did. Uh, he brought them then to the man 
to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. So God brought these animals to Adam so that he would observe them and name them, and likely he named them based on the, the observation that he made and the characteristics that he witnessed. Um, and so from the very beginning, man was studying God's creation, and God put him in a situation to do this. Uh, the man gave names to the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So God used this process of scientific observation to reinforce to Adam uh, God's creation and his purpose for Adam. So that when he would present him uh, with that uh, general revelation, presenting him with the wife that he created for him, uh, he would have an appreciation for it. This is really... The, uh, one of the major roles of general revelation so that we can better appreciate special revelation. Sometimes God uses general revelation, uh, that, that which is observable uh, phenomena, to enforce special revelation. This is true of nature metaphors and parables generally. Um, throughout scripture, God will use a metaphor from nature to help us understand a spiritual truth. And that's because we can observe the natural phenomena, but we cannot observe the supernatural. So to explain that to us, he puts it in the context of our physical world around us that we can observe. Uh, and parables as well. Parables deal with situations, though. Uh, a familiar situation in a culture or a society is able to be drawn upon for bringing a spiritual truth uh, for man to understand. Uh, but here in Genesis 2, man is able to better understand um, his role on earth and what God expects from him by watching God do that. This was unique to Adam. Adam watched God uh, uh, as God performed part of his creation in the creation account. Most everything was created before Adam got there. We'll look at that in a, in a bit, hopefully, um, in Genesis 1. Um, but um, Adam did get to witness one special creation. And that was the creation of his home, Eden. Um, Genesis 2, 7 says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So first here, this can only be known through special revelation. Man is not able to observe, test, or repeat this process. But God revealed that to him, and that's how we know. And then after man was created and after man became a living being, and he is awake, conscious, and uh, ready to go. Then the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. God first created man, then he created the garden of Eden for him, and then he put it in it. So Adam was able to observe this supernatural act of God within the natural world. So he is able to witness a miracle and a miracle is simply where the supernatural steps in to affect the natural. Um, and he is able to see what God is doing because, very importantly, Genesis 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. God didn't just put him in a garden that he'd, uh, he had not... Uh, he didn't just put him in the garden and say, uh, You go do you. He said, You go and do me do what I just did on a smaller scale. God created, God cultivated this garden and put Adam in it to say, do what I just did, keep doing that. Uh, work just as I have worked, but within his finite abilities. So in that way, man truly does reflect God, and God has been able to reveal through general and special re revelation how we can reflect God. Uh, we'll deal more with this when we get to uh, man being created in the image of God. Uh, so let's deal a bit then with these issues of naturalism and creationism, um, and then these compromised positions. We'll spend a lot more time on evolution naturally, um, since we all generally, I'm assuming, believe in creationism. And even some of these compromised positions, um, if we understand evolution and creation, uh, it'll be easier to see the problem with these. So we'll look at three main issues uh, that evolution has in its, um, in its design. First, uh, it lacks scientific evidence. This is ironic because it claims to be 
uh, the scientific response, but um, it doesn't have the evidence to back it up. Uh, evolution lacks empirical evidence from the normal domain of science. In this way, it is unscientific. It contradicts the laws of nature. Evolution is, uh, it blatantly contradicts the known laws of nature, those things which are observable, testable, repeatable. It contradicts those. Uh, and it supposes unknowable evidence. Evolution claims evidence from outside the purview of scientific observation. That graphic that we looked at of what man is able to observe, that is the limits of what science can tell us. Uh, God is able to reveal beyond that, but evolution claims to know evidence beyond that, but that is contrary to God's revelation. Um, so let's dig into each one of these a bit more. Uh, starting with the lack of scientific evidence. Uh, first, and this one should be uh, one that we're all familiar with, is the missing link. It's still missing. Uh, they have not found it. Uh, and this is a lack of evidence. In fact, in, as you read through uh, evolutionists com commenting on their own theories and views, often you'll see an expressed wish that they would have this evidence. Uh, wishing for evidence that's not there actually does contradict science and the scientific method. Um, you don't wish for um, what you would observe, but you observe and you answer based on those observations. So it's doing the scientific method backwards. Uh, if we were to put this in a context of, of biblical research, as some of us do, uh, this is a practice of eisegesis rather than exegesis. This is reading into the scientific process rather than reading out of it. Um, and so this, this naturally leads to faulty conclusions. Uh, so there is still no empirical evidence in the fossil record uh, or in any present day observation that one species can evolve to become a different species. Uh, this is true of a link between every single species. Now, often we hear of the missing link and we hear it in the singular. Uh, but I think this is carefully crafted in that way um, to make us think that they just need to find one missing link and suddenly the problem will be solved. The issue is that they are missing a link between absolutely every single species. As many species as you can contemplate, they are missing the link between that and the one that it supposedly came from. Um, and so that is a huge lack of evidence. It's not just the lack of one single critter. Uh, another issue in their evidence is uh, the faulty instruments that they use. Remember, we can enhance our ability to, uh, to observe, test, and repeat these tests with instruments. We can use telescopes, microscopes, um, slow down or slow motion cameras to capture this evidence. And one way that, um, that naturalists or actually creationists use these things too, uh, to varying degrees of success. Um, but one evidence that they propose for the, uh, for the uh, evolutionary theory would be carbon-14 dating. Uh, there are generally three kinds of carbon that, uh, that is present in man, carbon-12, 13, and 14. Carbon-14 is a um, radioactive uh, isotope, and so it's unstable. So it decays uh, uh, because of its instability, and it has a half-life, I think, of some 5,000 years or so. Um, so based on the decay of carbon-14 that they find in, in any carbon-based um, life form or in anything containing carbon-14, they, they assume that they're able to uh, date based on that half-life of carbon-14. Uh, the problem is, or one of the problems is, that this carbon-14 dating produces inconsistent data. Um, you can test uh, one thing twice and you might come up with a different conclusion based on what part of it you test. Um, I, I've seen some kind of ironic uh, news headlines, I think it was from uh, Creation Science magazine, where uh, they, they tested the living flesh of a penguin and came up with it being like 14,000 years old. Um, obviously, there's a flaw in this system. Uh, well, the primary flaw is that they are presupposing something called uniformitarianism. They're presupposing that the carbon-14 levels that exist today were the same uh, many, many years ago, and that the exposure at any point on the planet was also the same at any given time. Uh, carbon-based life forms will naturally consume uh, this carbon-14 from the materials around it. 
Um, and uh, but uh, we we cannot know exactly how much carbon something um, consumed uh, in history. Uh, and so these are simply things that uh, we don't have empirical evidence from history that man observed and passed down. Uh, we cannot know the carbon levels uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about uniformitarianism a bit more. Uh, there's also the evidence of fossil layers. Uh, this presents a different kind of uh, problem in dating, um, specifically the problem of circular reasoning. You've probably heard this before, uh, that the fossil layers are dated by the fossils they find in them. So if they find a T-Rex skeleton in one uh, layer, they're able to date, okay, well, we know the, the T-Rexes were alive at this point, therefore this layer belongs to such and such a period of history. But the problem is then when they're trying to date the fossils that they find in that layer, they date them based on what layer they're in. And so the fossils are dated by the layer that they're in and the layers are dated by the fossils that are in them. And this is uh, clear and simple, a case of circular reasoning. Um, and it is not scientific. Um, it is not logical and it leads to contradictions. And uh, I like to call it the self-licking ice cream cone of evolution. Um, it's just consuming itself. In evolution, we also get many contradictions of the known laws of science or the observable and repeatable laws of science. Um, and therefore, it is contrary to um, empirical evidence. Uh, one example would be mutations. Uh, natural selection depends on the false theory of gain of information mutations. Mutations cannot add information. They can only corrupt and lose information. Uh, so evolution depends on one creature of a of a lower organization able to become more organized and uh, elevate to a greater level of evolutionary sophistication, uh, which by necessity requires added information. Uh, but this is contrary to what we see whenever there is a mutation uh, in any species. The mutation depends on information that is already there, uh, either by losing it or by it becoming mutated or reorganized. But we can't add information um, to any uh, any being or species, or at least this doesn't occur naturally. Uh, the other contradiction is uh, this presupposition of biogenesis. Bio meaning life or natural life, and genesis meaning the beginning. Uh, this is the term for uh, life coming from life. Uh, evolution must accept the presupposition without proof, being unobservable, untestable, and unrepeatable, that life came from non-life. We don't have this issue in creationism because life comes from the ultimate source of life. In creationism, it comes from God who is himself eternal life. Um, but evolution depends on non-living beings producing living beings. Uh, we actually have a quote here from a man named Gerald Allen Kirkut. Uh, this is from the previous century, and he himself is an evolutionist, um, but he wrote a book on some of the, uh, the problems that evolutionists need to deal with uh, in the future. Uh, essentially, he he uh, passed the baton and said, we've got you guys this far. Um, this is what you need to deal with now. And so he lists out seven different suppositions or presuppositions that evolutionists have to receive on faith. Now, this is a big issue um, because evolution is supposed to be the solution to creationism's need for faith. Um, but evolution requires so much more faith than creationism does. Uh, the first assumption that evolutionists make is that non-living things give rise to living material. That is, that spontaneous generation occurred. They need to believe something that has never been observed, cannot be tested, and cannot be repeated. Uh, the second assumption is that spontaneous generation occurred only once. And the third assumption is that viruses, bacteria, plants, and animals are all interrelated. Uh, and so all of these are problems. You've got um, this uh, life coming from non-life, uh, but then if it needs to produce, what does it produce with? So we have uh, 
uh, non-life has to come, or life has to come from non-life at least twice um, with the sophistication and ability to reproduce itself. Um, and so this is just simply a, an a insurmountable problem that they have here. Uh, if you would like to, to see the rest of these, uh, these seven problems, they get more technical as he goes down. Uh, they're all, uh, they are all recorded in Arnold Fruchtenbaum's Handling of Evolution on page 16 of uh, Come and See, volume 6. <clears throat> Okay. Another contradiction uh, that we see within the scientific um, evidence against um, evolution is the second law of thermodynamics. It works directly against the presuppositions of evolution. Uh, this is the law of entropy. Uh, things of uh, greater organization tend towards lesser organization or sophistication and tends towards chaos. Uh, the basis for this is that energy, uh, which cannot be created or destroyed, as the first law of thermodynamics uh, states, um, energy as it is transferred becomes less useful. It doesn't disappear, it's just that uh, potential energy becomes kinetic energy. Um, once it is spent, um, doesn't disappear, but its energy is less useful for things like movement or organization, because organization... Uh, requires um, huge outputs of energy. Uh, so energy becomes less useful as it is transferred, and thus all things tend towards lower energy and lesser organization. Now, if we think then about what evolution presupposes, it's that things of no organization became a little bit organized, and then more organized, and then incredibly sophisticated. Uh, at every point in this process, it requires an external input of energy to do that organizing and then to maintain that organizing uh, and this simply contradicts what we see um, in the observable world which is that um, all things as they change become less organized um, apart from the external input of energy uh, here's a quote from harold francis bloom again a uh, a an evolutionist who uh, is a bit more honest than others about some of the problems in his view. Uh, he says, a major consequence of the second law of thermodynamics is that all real processes go toward a condition of greater probability. The probability function generally used in thermodynamics says that, left to itself, any isolated system will go toward greater entropy which also means toward greater randomization and greater likelihood. Now, this is a big problem in the evolutionary theory because their solution for the problems of evolution or the unlikelihood of evolution is to throw time at it. Uh, the more time you throw to it, the more um, hidden in, in eons of past time uh, some of these things are so that somebody might even be tempted to believe that the more time you, you throw out um, random elements, they might uh, become more organized. The problem with this is that thermodynamics shows us that the more time it has, the less organized it becomes. And so the evolutionary theory directly contradicts the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. All right, we'll look at some suppositions now. Uh, supposition of naturalism, evolution presupposes naturalism. Um, it does not have empirical evidence to say that there is no supernatural uh, reality. Um, it has to accept this on faith, uh, denying the possibility of a supernatural cause, supernatural intervention, or even the existence of the supernatural. Uh, this has even pervaded the field of, field of psychology, arguing that man is only natural and his physical phenomena are the product of chemical reactions in his body. Uh, we will deal with this when we get to psychology. Uh, much of today's modern psychology, which is divorced from biblical study, uh, depends on this idea of something like chemical imbalance being the cause of uh, disorders in the, uh, the mental life of humanity, when we know from biblical revelation that is, it is his separation from God that causes this problem. Uh, 
the assumption of uniformitarianism, which again is a big scary word, but within it we see the word uniform, and we've got an ism at the end, so we know this is uh, this is a view of uniformity, uh, and this claims that all things throughout history have remained uniform, so that if we test something today, we can assume that the test would have produced the same result in history and that it will produce the same result in the future as well. Uh, ironically, this uh, view of uniformitarianism butts up against uh, the other view uh, that naturalists tend to hold, uh, which is global warming or climate change, uh, that basically is that the climate is becoming worse and that uh, these uh, phenomena on Earth are changing throughout time um, to produce a worse environment. Yet when they do their studies of evolution, they assume uniformity in the past and in the future. Uh, so they, even within their own fields of science, they are contradicting themselves. Um, but the Bible does speak to this issue of uniformitarianism. In Second Peter uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 3 through 7, Peter writes, know this first of all, that in the last days, and that's us today in the church age, uh, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So he's saying these will come along and assume that the entire uh, history of the universe has continued in general uniformity, or at least the beginning of this world um, has continued uniformly since its beginning. Uh, he says then, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Now we have in here the introduction of special revelation, but in a very unique form, that form which God uses his word, his revelation to create. God supernaturally stepped in uh, and created time, space, and matter at a certain point. Not only that, but it existed and was upheld by the word, by his word. It was formed by his word out of water and by water, and uh, through which the world at that time was destroyed. There was a major cataclysm on this world that radically changed the environment and the way uh, that that uh, the earth and its its uh, scientific processes continue today would be distinct from before that major catastrophes or cataclysms on this earth uh, may have an effect on uh, on the way that scientific phenomena present themselves in the future i um, mean so we have to uh, recognize that when we're looking uh, into things that happened especially before the flood we cannot assume the same uh, testable, repeatable uh, evidences that we see today in science. Uh, we have to take God's word as the primary evidence uh, in those equations. So the world was destroyed, being flooded with water, and His word, uh, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly men. Uh, we also have here and in Genesis 18, 20, God is reserving the present uh, creation for his purposes. Uh, so in some cases, God maintains, and in other cases, God changes uh, what we observe in the scientific realm throughout history uh, so that we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, presume uh, that all of history, past and future, um, is going to produce the same results um, in scientific experimentation. Okay, I think we only have about 15 minutes left, so... Uh, we won't get to um, the portion on creationism, but we'll put that together when we look at man's um, physical and spiritual composition next week. But we will look at a few of these compromise positions before we conclude today. Uh, the first um, compromise position, and this is uh, probably one of the more popular ones. Um, you'll encounter it generally in both in conservative and in more liberal uh, congregations. You'll tend to get a scientist or something who's, who's been trained in, in a secular science who is also um, a believer um, but has not quite uh, uh, submitted all of his thinking to, to Scripture yet, and he tries to compromise between naturalism and supernaturalism or 
compromise between the denial of the supernatural and the acceptance of the supernatural. So theistic evolution presupposes that God used evolution to create. Now, this is an attractive theory uh, because in secular fields, which many of these people might work, or many of these people might uh, interact on every other day except for Sunday, uh, this allows them to have their cake and eat it too, to be a Christian, but also uh, not to be viewed as uh, ignorant of the modern modern in view of evolution. However, it is the weakest of both positions. It is weaker than creationism. Creationism is not a weak position, but it weakens that position and it is weaker also than evolution. Because theistic evolution, this theory, undermines the literal interpretation and imposes historical science over revelation. In other words, the only ability that we have to know the origins of this world, because we cannot observe it, we cannot test it, and we cannot reproduce it, we don't have any human revelation to tell us what happened because no humans were there to observe, test, and repeat, but God was. Not only that, but God's testimony is far superior to man's being perfect. And so uh, the, the person who accepts theistic evolution has denied the only source of evidence that can and does exist and has replaced it with a false science, a science that claims to know things that science itself cannot observe. Um, and so theistic evolution uh, is weak in the knees. Uh, the other theory would be the gap theory, and there's two distinct kinds of gap theory. Uh, and uh, this would be an interesting one to do a position paper on or, or uh, to do your homework on, because there's one gap theory that presupposes the need for ages and ages of time in order to have evolution occur or in order to have the earth get its, uh, its look of age. Uh, but then there's another gap theory view. Uh, we like to call it the chaotic earth view or reconstruction theories, uh, which is that in uh, Genesis 1-1, God created the earth. And then um, there is a period of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 in which God created the angels. He put them on this earth. The angelic fall occurred. God judged them and destroyed this earth. And then Genesis 1-2 picks up the story with the creation of a man's environment and then man. Um, one view is a compromise view. That's the gap theory that supposes evolution. The chaotic earth and reconstruction theories, views, these are not uh, compromise views because they're not compromising with evolution. They're trying to answer another biblical uh, problem, which is when did the angels fall? So I wouldn't lump this together under a compromise view. I don't think it's a correct view. Uh, we'll get into that when we get to angelology. You can read about it in Arnold Fruchtenbaum's uh, Man in Sin because he does hold to this view. And it is not a compromise with evolution. Um, but um, I, I don't think his evidence is strong enough. And I don't think the evidence for that view is strong enough. Um, but um, uh, I, I would really hesitate to just dismiss those people who hold this view because uh, they're not trying to undermine Scripture. They're trying to uphold the integrity of Scripture and to um, understand it systematically. Uh, so the gap theory, though, um, says that there are uh, there's a need for millions of years of evolution. Where can we put this if we want to believe God's word and take it literally? Well, we'll squeeze it in between verses rather than changing the meaning of verses. Um, and so that's that is a weak view. Um, we will we will deal with that more. Uh, there's the day age view. Uh, which is that the days listed in Genesis 1 are not 24-hour periods of time, um, but rather that these days represent ages or eons of, of history in which these things or processes were, were developed through evolution. Uh, so that would also be the, the long day theory is another name for that. Uh, let's see, this, this has its uh, primary problem in the fact that um, one, it goes against the literal and normal interpretation of, of Genesis 1. We have to use a special hermeneutic to get there. Um, and we don't use special hermeneutics. We take God's word literally, uh, historically, contextually, 
um, grammatically. We want to read God's word as if he is talking to us like we would talk to one another. Uh, we don't um, interpret things specially because there's really no no gauge or limit on that. Then we can make anything mean anything. Um, but as well, the, the Hebrew word yam um, can be used to uh, speak of longer periods of time. For example, um, the uh, day of the Lord uses the word yam, and it speaks of a three and a half year period um, of tribulation uh, ending in uh, the kingdom of God's promise. So this is longer than a day, but the problem is every time in scripture where yam is used together with a number, for example, the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, it always means a 24 hour period. We also in the text of Genesis 1 have the conclusion of each day that there was morning and then there was evening. Uh, the only way to read this literally is that the uh, that the cosmic bodies were moving as God had intended them to do. Uh, and we had day and night, and that was the end of the 24-hour period. Um, so these ideas, I'd, I'd be interested to, to see um, your dealing with them in the homework. Uh, we will uh, get into creationism next week. I think we've, uh, for a summary course, thoroughly handled evolution in this um, hour. Uh, there's so much more that can be said on it, so much more research that would be interesting to do. Um, so feel free to do this for your research or your uh, position paper if you'd like. Um, but let's go back to uh, the homework assignments. And I'll give you guys some time to, to discuss what you'd like to do. Uh, while I'm getting there, do you guys have any questions? Are your slides available to us later if we need to review them? Yes, I will put the slides up on the website. Uh, yeah, and they'll, they'll be under lesson two or the second hour for week one. Okay. We'll share with you. Okay. Well, well, let me open all three of them at once. Um, but so for the first homework option, you'd write a one-page paper, 12-point double-spaced, um, briefly explaining the role of general and special revelation in discovering reliable information about human origins. Number two briefly explain the theory of evolution and the idea that it is proven based in scientific fact and removes the need for faith. The third option would be to explain and analyze one or more of the compromised positions, uh, the gap theory, the chaotic earth theory, which is, um, as I said, not a compromised position, but you could um, analyze whether or not it's a compromised position. Um, or if, if you hold to that view, you could uh, argue your case for that. That's also a good um, position paper. Um, the day-age theory or theistic evolution. So for these, because we didn't get to spend as much time in class, uh, your readings will be helpful for this. Uh, the Arnold Fruchtenbaum reading will, will cover uh, these a little more thoroughly than the uh, Chafer reading. But uh, if you would like to read Chafer on these issues, um, I've also included his. Um, works chapter 11, 12, and 13. Um, if you have time, I know I've, I've given you lots of reading to do. Uh, chapter 11 is pretty short and it gives an introduction to anthropology. Um, it, it's also worth reading. He'll, he'll get into more of the, uh, the need for uh, special revelation to understand general revelation. He won't use those terms exactly, but you'll recognize the principle. So that would help with homework question number one. Okay, um, now these are available on the website. Um, I I didn't make them available in print for you. Would you guys like me to, to do that or to get them to you in an email somehow? Well, I think if they're on the website, that's fine. Okay. Okay. And uh, do you, any of you have an idea yet of which one 
you're planning to do. And remember that you can do a, a one-page response to one of these and write a paragraph on the others if you'd like to. Sure. You know, I'll probably just sit down and like start out writing a paragraph with each of you, which one and okay. best that's generally how I approach writing assignments and things like that, is I just write a little bit each. And, uh, Carlos, feel free to to uh, to uh, participate in the homeworks as well. Um, it, would, it would be good for you and for your classmates to, to have your thoughts on them also. And, uh, so I, I would encourage that. And, and I'll read it. I, I won't give it a grade, but I'll read it. And uh, give you comments on it. Maybe if you know for sure, then I'll take another one just so we have a discussion. Yeah. Or I'll probably know by tomorrow. Okay. So I can yeah, see what it has us, to do. Yeah, we'll make sure we try to know Because, like you said, it's good to okay. talk about it. Yeah. 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 All right, you guys, um, it's been an awesome time together. Um, I'll close us in a word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll let you go, and I'll see you next week. Dear Father, we thank you so much uh, for the wonderful opportunity that we have to study your word um, and to know certainly, based on your testimony, what is true, uh, so that when we look out in the world around us, uh, we don't have to be uh, swayed by various doctrines that deny your, your truth and your reality. Uh, but that we can stand firmly uh, on the, the truth of our special creation by you, of our purpose and uh, position in your plan and program, and the glory that you have planned for your son and that we have a promise of sharing in. Uh, we thank you that you have so graciously poured on us all these wonderful gifts that we do not deserve. And we pray that we would bring you uh, so much glory uh, in trusting your word and believing it and in uh, and in praising you and teaching your word. We do praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you, guys. And I'll see you next week. See ya.